Okay, um, before, our, we, before we take our break, we have another talk. And this talk is by Philip Lindsay, who travels the world, doing astrology everywhere. And we know him as the uh, author of The Hidden History of Humanity, wonderful uh, book that includes the great cycles of the history of our Earth and many esoteric astrological writings. And what is it, the heart of astrology? The heart of the your, your talk? It's a good catchy, catchy title. A good, good catchy title today. Something about the heart of esoteric astrology. Something of that nature. But sure. we all know titles don't make any difference. So I just say, give me a title and talk about what you want. <laughs> okay. Just give me one minute to get Yes, to yes. To and here, uh, Astrologers, is the list of all of the group members. So if you want to put that in, it's under pre going to go look at your quintiles now, aren't you? You're latent ge You know you're a genius, of course. You know that. If you, know, if you have soul consciousness, you are a genius. Th that is, you know, when the fifth petal of the egoic lotus opens up and the solar angel begins to take an interest in you, the personality, this is genius coming through. So all you have to do is focus on the higher mental plane and your genius will pour down into your otherwise whatever brain. It's very interesting. We all have quintiles and they have great potentials. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <coughs> yes. Yes. Surely. Can I answer it? Okay. That's right. And, and if, you, if you also think in terms of, well, what did he do for us, the life that he lived? Well, he showed us. Just as we all must come to that place, says every Scorpio, <laughs> where we look at the dark, where we look at what is held beneath in the subconscious of our own individuality or of humanity. Only then can we release ourselves from that. Yeah. You know so. what occurred to me was, and you didn't talk about it, and I don't know if you could see it, but every distortion has. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. You know, one of the things that I found challenging, but then I like challenges. <laughs> is that his chart bears a lot of resemblance to my own chart. He grew up in a part of the United States that I grew up in. Um, you know, we both have a Libra and Ascendant. I mean, what isn't nice about a Libra <laughs> Ascendant, you know? He had Venus squaring Uranus. So do I. Yeah. So I, you know, I had to go through that process of looking at the darkest aspects of my own nature, which I have seen, I don't particularly enjoy looking at it, but I, you know, I have seen it, but it, it still made me sick as I went through his chart because it is so profoundly distorted. And yet it's a service. Testing, yeah. testing. 
Well, um, I was looking for a subject to uh, do, and then it was, I finally had a duh moment. Oh, I'm, I might as well do it on Krishnamurti, so I'm giving the book away at the conference. And I think I've covered it briefly before Krishnamurti's chart, but he's such a good example to keep coming back to because <coughs> he's so well known, so many events happen in his life, his birth chart or his birth time is, and is therefore ascendant is, is pretty um, uh, accurate. And also he had a unique role, a uh, spiritual role, uh, for like a previous agreement before he incarnated to, to serve the hierarchy, to serve as a vehicle for the Christ. So he's, that, that was the reason why I originally wrote this book because there were so many life events, so many biographies, that you could check and see the consciousness unfolding uh, with all these life events and how he uh, took those challenges or, or met them and so forth. So we're going to look at his chart in, in a while and from a very simple um, uh, interpretive perspective. But what I want to show you first is a list of things that I've taken from the book that we are given as guidelines for, for esoteric interpretation, and it's quite a few. Uh, this book, I think, took me about six months to write. I think the first couple of months was just trying to ascertain his rays from what I read in books without even looking at the chart. And then I started looking at the chart and looked at that in terms of how the, the, the ray structure interfaced with the, with the chart. So DK gives us a, a list of guidelines. I just want to run through them briefly, and I might get you just to scroll for me, Lawson, uh, occasionally. Um, here. The first thing, the keynote of the signs. These express the underlying effect upon the man as he progresses in one or two directions. Obviously on the immutable cross, or on the reverse wheel, on the, um, on the fixed cross the nature of the cross upon which the person is crucified at any time. Is it the mutable cross, the cardinal cross, or the fixed cross? And a lot of these things have to be ascertained intuitively by the astrologer. We can't, there is no concrete formula where we can say this is thus and so, therefore it is. Because we could be considering the chart of an advanced initiate or a chicken egg. So, Point two, if he will distinguish between the effects of the sacred planets and the non-sacred, he will find the sacred... Oh, hang on, we've jumped. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, point three, the influence of the planetary rulers, orthodox or esoteric. And we'll be working with that when we look at his chart in a minute. Um, most of you know that the, the orthodox rulers correspond to the personality. The esoteric rulers correspond to the soul or the higher self and the hierarchical rulers correspond to the monad or the spirit. Um, so, point four, the rays which primarily express themselves through a particular sign. Um, all the signs of the zodiac take different rays through them and we have to be careful about the rays that we have ascertained in a person's makeup versus how they're expressing through the chart because the chart is an interface for the expression of the rays. Uh, I do come from this, the school of thought that you, that you can't get your rays from the horoscope. Um, but you can sail very close to the wind in terms of that interface, that expression of the rays through the chart. Point five, the qualities of the sign and of the man who has come forth in a particular sign. The interplay between a sign and its polar opposite. This is very important. Um, the signs, DK tells us, are six pairs of signs that, uh, that create the 12 signs and we balance the pairs of opposites within ourselves through the, the opposite signs. Point seven, uh, the planets which are exalted in detriment and fall indicate the three phases of the path. This is one of the mysterious um, uh, statements of DK that we still haven't figured out yet. In fact, all of the esoteric astrologers I know, we've, we've all got little pieces of the puzzle, but this, is, this science is going to take hundreds of years to develop into something that is far more workable than what we have now. And a lot of it has to do with the development of the intuition and the transcendence of the concrete mind. If you 
can just go to uh, scroll down a bit, please, Lawson. On your computer? Oh, it's, oh, it's on that one. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, if you like, yeah, a little bit more. It's just so number eight is at the top there. Um, stop. Whoop, back, 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 back. Back for number eight at the top. That's it. Very good. Uh, the significance of the keywords for the modes of progress through the sign. So there are key notes, there are key words for all the signs and the planets, of course, and we can um, get clues in interpretation from that. Uh, number nine, the underlying theme of any specific zodiacal, zodiacal sign covered by the ideas of recreation, regeneration, reorientation, renunciation. And there's a whole section about that in esoteric astrology. Then in a different part of the book, he he uh, enjoins us to look at other things, such as number one here, the investigating astrologer will substitute the esoteric planets for the orthodox exoteric planets, and I've indicated these in connection with the signs of the zodiac. He'll get much instructive information, and if he or she perseveres, the verification of my ideas. We are in the process of just starting this. We're just scratching the surface of this immense so-called science of all sciences. Number two, if he will distinguish between the effects of the sacred planets and the non-sacred, he will find the sacred planets endeavour to fuse the personality and make it the instrument of the soul, and then the non-sacred and the non-sacred planets influence more specifically the form nature. Much light on the pull between the pairs of opposites may then pour in. So these are all profound statements, which you could practically write a book on each statement, just going with with the little hints that he's that he's put in there. Point three, if he will study the fluid area where the planets veiled by the sun and moon come into play and will realise that he must decide from a study of the chart of the subject and any knowledge he may have, what is the point in evolution reached and which of the three veiled planets is the ruler, he will get much intuitive understanding. Well, this requires all intuition. There's, there's no concrete approach to this particular fact and it's one of the most important things he will find himself able to throw much light on the problem of the probationary disciple when considering the exoteric rulers and the problems of disciples when dealing with the esoteric rulers. So, he's given us much to explore here. And so what I've tried to do in my book is apply, which was written in about 2002, is to apply as much as I knew then about esoteric astrology in my previous study for, the, for about 20 years, I guess, and apply it to the life that was lived. And so the first part of the book is, um, uh, is ascertaining his rays, is about the interpretation of his chart. And the second half of the book is looking at the major life crises and initiations and applying that information and the criteria that DK has given us for the, for the uh, initiations to um, how he met those and so, and that's, that's why I call the book The Initiations of Krishnamurti because I believe he came in as a second degree initiate and took the third and fourth degrees in that life. And so each of the initiation experiences are dated exactly, even the time of day in some cases. So we are able to look at the progressions and transits to his chart on those dates and actually... Um, check to see if the criteria is present and in every case I found the criteria more than present. Point four, uh, we're up to point four, you will realise that I am only dealing with the interplay between the planets and the centres where man is concerned and only in a broad and general sense be because that interplay is dependent upon the point of evolution, whether the focus of the life is below or above the diaphragm, in process of transference from the lower to the higher. Uh, the rays of the personality and the soul, the condition of the centres, whether they are awakened, awakening, or as yet undisturbed. Whoops. Oh. <laughs> Just go back up to that last point if you can, Lawson. Um, I think it was there somewhere. Stop. Where are we? Is it, where was I? Is it, is it there? No. Oh, okay. So, um, DK tells us there are several sub-sciences to the science of all sciences. The science of the chakras, the science of the centres. 
and so forth. So all these things have to come into account. And of course, in the future, when uh, etheric vision is more developed with astrologers, they'll be able to just look at the person and see the condition of their centers, much like a master does today. Uh, but this is a long way down the track. Um, where was I up to? Um, was it here? D? The sun sign with the exoteric planetary rules rules the personality, indicates inheritance and equipment, and is a summation of that which has been, thus providing the background. Uh, we'll talk more about this later on. The rising sign with the esoteric planetary rulers indicates sole purpose and points the way to the future, offering opportunity. And this is one of the main simple approaches that most of us use. If you can just go up a bit, please, Lawson. The horoscope. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Six. Six, yeah. Horoscope built around the sun sign is adequate for ordinary humanity. The exoteric planets rule and the man lives within the limitations of the 12 houses. The 12 houses being the area of life experience, the 12 signs being the quality aspect. Um, point seven, the horoscope built, around, built up around the rising sign with the esoteric planets ruling will convey the destiny of the disciple. As I told you, the disciple will later be responding to the influences of the 12 arms of the three crosses as they pour their influences through esoteric planetary rulers via the 12 houses. The sun sign, governed by the ruling planets and the rising sign, governed also by the esoteric planets, can both be used in casting horoscope of the initiate when superimposed upon each other, the outer life of the initiate in the three worlds and the inner life of subjective realization will appear. This mode of superimposition will be a feature of a new astrology. So I experimented with a couple of different ways of superimposition in the book, which I'm not going to go into today. It will take too long to explain. But suffice to say that, that that's what we have to do. We have to experiment with these methods and, and prove it, so to speak, uh, that they actually work and are viable. <coughs> You've just skipped again. Skip it. We have, is that where we're up to already? Okay. Um, when the sun sign with the exoteric rulers is worked out in a chart, the rising sign with the esoteric rulers is also worked out <coughs> and the two superimposed upon each other, the problem of the disciple in any one incarnation will, will appear. So, um, if you just go down to the chart, please, Lawson. <laughs> He's elusive, this guy. I think it's his Venus in Gemini. Um, okay, so most of you know who Krishnamurti is, right? You've probably read a book about him or heard about him. He used to give talks here in California, um, and he was around a long time. He died at the age of 91. His brief from the inner ashram was to be a vehicle for the expression of the hierarchy and the Christ. And he went along with that plan in some ways, but in other ways he rebelled against it too. He had a somewhat stubborn Taurian nature uh, and a somewhat rebellion, rebellious Aquarius rising quality as well. Now, if we look at Aquarius rising as the sole potential that he is to express in any given lifetime, then it's about ultimately being the world server. And, um, and he certainly did that in, in, in various ways and modes throughout his lifetime. Um, I'm sure the, the experiment with the hierarchy was a partial success, although it wasn't a complete success. Uh, because of the vicissitudes of not only his personal life, but just the general situation of the time back in the uh, last century. Anyway, um, we can look at Aquarius as being a sign of the group, group work, group processes, group cooperation. It's the sign, of course, that we're going into for the next precession cycle of 2,160 years. And in many ways, Krishnamurti's um, uh, uh, sole, sole purpose was to help bridge the passing age of Pisces into the new age of Aquarius by enunciating the principles of the ageless wisdom and, and um, and the hierarchical impulse that, that has been gradually coming through in the last hundred years. And he did and he didn't. He kind of uh, um, rebelled against the being 
um, supervised and coached by, by some of the theosophists of the time. Um, and because of all the hype that was built up around him. And you can't blame him in many ways from doing that. But also he, he is said by one of the masters in the, in the, um, the Cyril Scott books, the Initiate series, that he reverted to an old form of ad Advaitism, Advaita uh, or Vedanta um, that wasn't appropriate for the, that current uh, age that he, he was teaching in. So there are various factors which reflect this and perhaps we can touch on them as we go into, into um, um, analyzing the chart and the other astrologers, please jump in if you want to and, and add your two cents worth. Um, let's start with Aquarius, the rising sign. Uh, most of you probably know that the rising sign is determined by the time of birth, the exact time of birth. It represents the sign on the eastern horizon that is astronomically appearing above the Earth's horizon. Okay, so it's rising. Sure. It's called by DK the sun of possibility, whereas the sun sign itself is called the sun of probability. So the point of resistance for most of us is to express the sun sign or the moon sign because it's the most known in some respects. But the rising sign is not the point of least resistance for any of us. It needs work. And for most of unconscious humanity, the rising sign be is, becomes just a superficial mask that we express ourselves through, but, but not necessarily realize our full potential. So that is one of the essential differences between esoteric and exoteric astrology, that um, um, the situation is somewhat reversed. In, in exoteric astrology, the sun is the spirit and the rising sign is the personality. Whereas in esoteric astrology, the, the sun sign is the personality, the threefold integrated lower self, and the, the rising sign is the potential that is unfolding. So Uranus, of course, the ruler of the seventh ray, is the ruler of Aquarius. And we find Uranus in Scorpio in the ninth house, the most elevated planet in the chart. So it's extremely powerful. One, it's exalted in Scorpio, and two, it's the most elevated planet in the horoscope. The most elevated planet quite often can dominate a chart in terms of its expression or its visibility. Um, oops, can we? Oh. <laughs> Krishna Murthy is standing by. <laughs> He's just shut down. Yeah. Have you run out of power there? Is that is that power cord in? Oh, it is. Anyway, I'll keep on talking about Uranus and Scorpio for a moment. And why is Uranus exalted in Scorpio? Well, Scorpio is a sign not unlike Capricorn in that it's a sign of initiation. And it's very much a sign to do with the second degree initiation where the complete conquering of the, of the astral body or the, or the control of the astral body is demonstrated. One of the most difficult, if not the most difficult initiation to take, even more difficult than the higher initiations in some respects. And Uranus, of course, is a planet that rules the seventh ray that is on the, the, the odd ray mental line. So its position in Scorpio has a lot to do with that, that mental um, uh, control or detachment that is, that is cultivated in Scorpio that allows the Scorpio candidate for initiation to take initiation. This talk has been very reluctant from the start. I couldn't get it going on my computer or, or Peter's and now Lawson's. <laughs> Krishnamurti wishes to remain hidden and, and occult. Anyway, I'll keep on talking because I know his chart. Um, <laughs> that Uranus at the top of his horoscope is opposite his sun sign Taurus and both the planets make a T-square into his rising sign. So in one fell swoop, everything, Christian Modi's chart is an amazing chart. Everything comes together in this particular T-square because the sun sign represents the personality that one brings into alignment uh, with the higher self, which is represented by the rising sun. So the sun is square to the sign and opposite the ruler of the rising sun. <laughs> it's going to another computer. Four times lucky. <coughs> um, so, 
Um, now, Uranus in Scorpio in the ninth house has an incredibly penetrating quality. Scorpio is the sign of, of penetrating the veil, of, of really getting behind that which is, uh, um, is behind the outer seeming of things on the physical plane. And, um, and, and Krishnamurti had this very penetrating mind. He could hold his own with any intellectual or any scientist of, of his day. There are other parts of the chart which actually re reflect this, but um, Uranus and Scorpio, oh, we've lost all the glyphs now. We've lost all the glyphs. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> Maybe we can put it up on the whiteboard. Oh, well, if you just put it on, yeah, 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 thanks. That's, that's all we need. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, might be he might be rolling in his grave. <laughs> well, he might have come back one. So, um, I'll just wait for a second while these guys do their darndest. You put the earth in. Um, I'll just sing it, yeah. Maybe make all the plants black if possible. And take the asteroids out if you could. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Not there. Um, you go, oh. If you just right mouse click on the on the actual wheel, uh, Michael, you'll get another menu uh, come up. Just cancel that. Right mouse click and go to display points. That's it. Thanks. That's better. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so we're talking about this T-square, Uranus as the ruler of the rising sign, exalted in Scorpio, the most elevated planet, opposing the sun sign quite closely, within a couple of degrees, and both of them T-squaring the rising sign. And in fact, you could call it a grand cross if you wanted to put the descendant angle in, the two angles there. But just for simplicity, we can consider it as a, as a T-square. And so this brings into uh, immediately looking at the, this rising sign ruler, this direct relationship between the rising sign and the sun sign, between the soul and the personality, um, and the integration of those factors uh, within the personality particularly in order to, to uh, affect the right type of alignment for the expression of the highest self through Aquarius. Because, for instance, uh, if we look at Taurus from a basic personality point of view, um, they can be very stubborn and really dig their heels in. And Krishnamurti did that several times. Um, and if you look at the opposition to Uranus, you, uh, sun opposite Uranus can be, can be quite the, um, the rebel, the rebel without a cause. So the combination of both those factors uh, would have required some integrating in, in Krishnamurti's earlier life. And, you know, you, I often ask myself the question when I'm looking at charts like this or dealing with clients' charts, 
you know, that this degree of integration is, is also relative. We chip away at it and we get so much percentage of that integration done in any lifetime that might qualify us for a minor or a major initiation somewhere down the track. Um, it's never perfect. And Krishnamurti really sh showed his humanity through all his imperfections of his personality. I found out a lot of stuff about him after I finished writing a book, actually, uh, because I, I was staying in Ojai, where he spent the last 20 years of his life. And uh, I heard all the stories. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to do an updated version of this book somewhere down the track. All the scandal and the gossip and all the rest of it. But um, anyway, so this, this uh, quality of, um, of Taurus, we can see Taurus as the mother of illumination esoterically. We know Taurus is an incredibly acquisitive sign in terms of money and gold and possessions and all that kind of stuff. Um, yet Taurus esoterically is far more acquisitive of spiritual knowledge, uh, which is illumination, of course. And Venus, as the ruler of Taurus, is most appropriate to talk about, particularly right now as it's so bright in the night sky in the constellation Taurus. Um, so Krishnamurti had this, uh, you could say his sun sign represented the, uh, the reservoir of spiritual knowledge that he brought in with him from other lives. Um, his, it was a major resource in many ways. But also we can say that the moon up here in Sagittarius was also part of that spiritual knowledge which he brought in. And it was also part of his Achilles heel uh, it, that, that, that created somewhat of an obstacle in him truly realizing his full dharma. Um, it's hard to be a judge in this situation because you, you can't really judge. You can only just observe and say, this is what happened and that, that's what happened. Uh, but you can't necessarily say that he failed. Uh, because he, he actually did go on to take the fourth initiation, it is said. Uh, and that is about as high as you can go as far as the, the uh, human experience goes before it's the liberation initiation. So, um, so I, I maintain that this uh, Sun Uranus uh, opposition was extremely dynamic in terms of his knowledge, in terms of his penetrating power of his mind to really go into things very deeply with um, David Bohm, the physicist, with many other intellectuals of his time. He could hold his own, even if he had never read a book on the subject. Um, so it showed this incredible reservoir of knowledge that he had brought in with him and also his intuition, too. He's extremely intuitive, I think. Um, he only a a actually owned one book, I think, and that was the Bible. He only read, you know, read very regularly from the Holy Bible. That's about, he wasn't particularly religious or a Christian or anything like that as such, but he really had no need for books or any more information. He had it all in here. Um, now, if we look at the dispositor or ruler of Taurus, it's Venus, and we find that Venus is in Gemini, which is also very powerful because Venus is the sole ruler of Gemini. When I said to Michael this morning, Venus uh, reconciles the pairs of opposites upon the mental plane and creates beauty, I was thinking of Venus in Gemini um, because of its whole making ability, its ability to reconcile opposites and to transcend duality and to bring unity from duality. Um, of course, Venus in Gemini is extremely, extremely adept in the personality expression sense of um, being able to connect with all sorts of people from all walks of life. Venus in Gemini can connect with the beggar and the king and all, everything in between. Um, it, it find that uh, what, what DK calls that, that, um, that point in common because Gemini is one of the signs of the common cross or the mutable cross. And... Um, so, now Venus, uh, oh yeah, and Venus is exactly opposite his moon in Sagittarius. So the Gemini Sag polarity is equally as strong, I think, as the Taurus Scorpio polarity in this chart. Um, his moon is in the Aquarian house. Can you just hit the, um, the, the touchpad? Oh, I forget what computer it's on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Venus is 
conjunct Jupiter and about by about eight or nine degrees. And Jupiter is the sole ruler of Aquarius. So we have these extraordinary kind of relationships in, in this chart. I'm going to come back to this later on. Um, but I just want to mention that for now. Uh, Michael, can you just hit the time? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so <laughs> we also have, he also had, had Mercury in Gemini. Um, no, sorry, Mercury in Taurus. Can't see it very well there. It's yellow. But, um, so, have have most of you heard of what what's called in astrology the final dispositor? Okay, it's where you you trace the final dispositor through the ruler of the rising sign or the sun sign, and the planet that you come back to last is a very powerful planet. And I've done this with a lot of a lot of different charts. Um, we just just before we go into Mercury, I'll just show you how it works. We can just do a brief one here with the rising sign. We look at the rising sign exoterically. We look at the exoteric ruler, which is Uranus. We find Uranus is in Scorpio. And Scorpio is ruled by Mars, one of the planets anyway. And Mars is in Cancer over here. You can hardly see it. So a chance you can change all those planets to black, Michael. If you that's going to be in colour scheme. Yeah. Yep. And uh, aspect, of aspect no, sorry, point colours, yeah. And, and you should say all black. There you go. Thanks. <coughs> there we go. Um, Mars is in Cancer, and the Moon rules Cancer, and the Moon is in Sagittarius, and Jupiter is the ruler of of, uh, of Sagittarius and Jupiter is in Cancer. We've already been to Cancer. So Jupiter is the final dispositor in this chart. It also happens to be the esoteric ruler of the rising sign. And Jupiter is exalted in Cancer, just as, you, as Uranus was exalted in Scorpio. Two water signs, two exaltations. Very interesting. Um, and it's conjunct Venus, which is the dispositor or ruler of the sun sign. So this chart is tied together so well, I find, uh, compared to, to many other charts. This, this is quite extraordinary, this chart. And I think they probably, they, they probably scan quite a few decades to actually get this chart right, I think, for, for this incarnation because of the, of the group work which was behind Krishnamurti, that was planned behind him in which he, he made a previous agreement about, obviously. Any questions or comments you want to make? That's right. Mars is conjunct Sirius and Jupiter is conjunct Sirius. And I make this point in the book. Um, uh, Sirius, of course, is, is connected to the third degree initiation um, and, of course, is the highest self of this entire solar system. As I was saying to someone else before in our breakout group, um, the fixed stars affect us whether we're, or we can invoke their energies, whether they are actually conjunct a planet or not. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people probably don't have conjunctions of certain fixed stars with certain planets, but those fixed stars would certainly be affecting them. Um, if we look at the illusion of astronomy and the ecliptic, where all the planets are circulating and its relationship to the uh, stars right out there in the, in the heavens, you can, s you can get that, that, that sense of um, illusion, if you like, of, of how that energy funnels back into the chart. So anyway, it, I thought it was very significant that he had Mars and Jupiter, excuse me, uh, Mars 11 degrees uh, Cancer conjunct Sirius. Jupiter is very wide of, of the conjunction. Nicholas? Hello. Hello. Sirius is about 12 degrees, I think. 13, 12 or 13. 12, 12 back then. Back then. Yeah. 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 And, f and fur furthermore, uh, about these uh, background prominent stars, he's 
he's not only got that Mars uh, conjunct Sirius, he's got, if because this is an initiate uh, to me, and um, for an initiate like this, we need also to involve the hierarchical rulerships of the horoscope. Absolutely. And, and that then takes us to several other uh, stellar sources in yeah. this chart. Because, for example, if we look at the Aquarian rising, the moon is the hierarchical yes. ruler. I'm going to I'm going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. Should I should I continue or should I? Go on. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. So 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 the moon is the ruler of that rising sign, which takes us to twenty five fifteen of Sag, which is conjunct the galactic center, yeah. which is very significant for what he was seeking to achieve in his life. Mm -hmm. If you take the other uh, angle, which is the midheaven in Scorpio, you find it at 26 degrees, and the hierarchical ruling planet in Scorpio is Mercury, That's right. which is found down at the bottom of the chart, symbolically. Opposite the, the midheaven. Opposite the midheaven, mm. down at the lowest point, the mm. base of the chart, mm. conjunct the seven sisters of the Pleiades. That's right. Uh, so the two ruling planets, hierarchically speaking, of the horoscope, of the angles of the horoscope, are conjunct, should we say, the two, um, two centermost point within our closest universe. Good point. Yeah. And then in addition to that, if you want to add something more, that Venus is conjunct Polaris mm -hmm. and Betty right. Juice, That's right. which which basically takes him to the top of the mountain <laughs> <laughs> and it does. beyond. It does. Um, I deal with most of these fixed star positions in the book and, and one of the ones that I find fo the most fascinating is Mercury conjunct the Pleiades because this illustrates Krishnamurti's acute intelligence. The Pleiades, of course, are the source in many ways of this third aspect or third ray of active intelligence. And Mercury in one of its expressions is the third ray. You know, you have th the third, fourth, and fifth rays all associated with Mercury. So um, Mercury in almost the last degree of, of Taurus uh, represents this, um, uh, very much this acquisitive nature of, of, of knowledge. And quite often Mercury and Taurus have photographic memories. I don't recall whether I actually mentioned that in the book, but is something I read in an old astrological textbook once, and I found it to be true in quite a few clients' charts over the years. They'd say, yeah, that's right, I've got photographic memory, how do you know? So I read in a book. <laughs> so, um, uh, but combined with the Sun and Taurus, Mercury, Mercury uh, conjunct the Sun there is very powerful in terms of that retentive, uh, the ability to retain so much knowledge. But one of the things I go into in the, um, in the book is about how he has to release all that knowledge as well, or relinquish it. Um, DK tells us in Esoteric Astrology that, that Scorpio constitutes, um, uh, is related to the, to the dweller, particularly in relation to memory. Therefore, memory of, of, um, of um, bringing forth, bringing back the knowledge, so to speak. So, Taurus can be enormously acquisitive and knowledgeable and almost overloaded with information and, and knowledge, but not necessarily intuitive. In, in Krishnamurti's case, he was intuitive. But I, I would say that there would have had to have been a lot of relinquishing of that particular knowledge. And in fact, what actually happened, Krishnamurti literally had his hard drive cleared twice in that lifetime. He said he, he lost twice in, in one lifetime all knowledge of what, previous knowledge of what had actually occurred in his life before those particular events, which is amazing. So it's quite a healthy thing in terms of relinquishing that knowledge and moving towards the intuition. Of course, the intuition is, is intimate, uh, intimately related to the buddhic plane, the fourth plane, which is related to the fourth initiation, and that's where he was headed. Um, the third aspect of knowledge, even though it's so strong his chart in so many different places, he was in the process of relinquishing and releasing and, and moving far more into the intuitive realm. So um, 
when we look at the science of initiation, one of the sub-sciences of, of esoteric astrology, um, I came to the conclusion, I'm not sure whether I came to the conclusion in the book or later on, that he came, he came in as a second degree initiate about to take the third. And the reason I say that is that the experience for the third initiation was such an amazing experience that it couldn't have been a recapitulation. And I have a chapter on it where he, he meets with the Buddha, he has these incredible downloads of energy and, uh, and, and head pains and so forth. And to me, that didn't seem like a recapitulation. That seemed like a, the first time ever. Um, and I believe that the hierarchy had knew this and wanted him to take the third degree as part of his, his due, if you like, um, because sometimes in some lives we can't take initiation because the astrological conditions aren't right. We have to wait for another life to get the right conditions to actually take that initiation. And I suspect that that's what actually happened in Krishnamurti's case. Um, but it seems from all the background reading that I did with the Initiate series books uh, and, and other material that I don't think the hierarchy actually anticipated that he would take the fourth initiation. Um, it's a possibility anyway. I, I'm not kind of stuck on that, but uh, he did go ahead nevertheless and on his own initiative he took the fourth initiation eventually. Or according to one of the masters through in the, in the initiate books if you, want to, um, if you want to use that as a valid uh, reference. Uh, did you have something to say about that, Michael? No, okay. Um, but um, be that as it may, he served as a mouthpiece uh, for many years for the hierarchy. Frankly, personally myself, I, I found most of his talks incredibly boring. I say that, that with the greatest respect. I couldn't even understand most of what he was talking about. But I suspect that what most people got was actually what was coming through him, not necessarily what he was saying. And he was talking, in many ways, he was talking in the, in the old sort of Vedanta speak uh, in, with, with you know, modern 20th century language. Um, but I, I really was shocked because I just didn't find him that interesting and couldn't understand actually what he was saying. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, everyone's different. But one of the main things, of course, that he taught people to do was to think independently. And it was on this particular theme of, of, speaking independent, uh, of thinking independently that he got himself into hot water over the masters. He said, you know, um, don't follow the masters and um, be more independent and so forth. And the criticism in retrospect about that from one of the masters in the initiate books was that he um, had gathered such a huge following and so many aspirants really hung on every word that he said and he just left them dangling, you know, um, and, and, and didn't really see, uh, couldn't really see how, um, you know, what he was doing. And uh, another thing was that they said that he, he tended to address everybody as if they were the monad. <laughs> because he was coming into monadic consciousness himself and he had this naive type of sim simplicity which, which um, again, uh, made him blind to these things when he was, when he was communicating to people. So, um, very interesting life. And yet, in page 70, page 71 of Esoteric Astrology, DK gives us the criteria by which uh, for, for the different initiations and for what planets influence what initiation. And each date that I checked, as I said before, all those particular criteria were in, were in place either by transit or natally. And that's something else I want to bring up too in, in, in regard to uh, this morning's session, is that we all have, for instance, Venus in a certain place in our, horosco in our natal horoscope. But for... Um, for a lot of us, it moves at least one sign or two signs or even three signs in a lifetime by progression. So where your Venus is now by progression uh, actually says a lot about how your natal Venus has developed in a sense. And you can say that for most progressed planets. Uh, they're very important to track, especially Sun, Venus, uh, Moon, uh, Mercury to a degree, in terms of, your, of where your unfolded consciousness is now. So, of obviously, 
uh, Krishnamurti would have had a lot of um, uh, Venus, Mars and so forth would have been in Leo, Virgo at various times during his life, maybe even further into Libra. Um, and what I found it with many of the life events, what, as in any chart of any life that's been lived, is that there were pretty amazing progressions and transits lining up with each other that perfectly depicted and told the story about what was going on with those life events, particularly the initiations. And so I learned an incredible amount about that. I, I loved actually writing the book. Um, there are quite a few, um, there's about 60 pages just on interpretation techniques and, uh, and a few experimental ones that I tried. Um, but it's, even if you don't know astrology, I think it's relatively accessible, it's particularly the second half of the book that talks about his life and the life events. Uh, I want to ask you uh, were you checking uh, um, when he took the fourth initiation well you see what I am seeing here it's a powerful relationship between already the planet which was so emphasized and that is the Mercury, which is one of the energies involved mm -hmm. at the fourth initiation because it's in a Capricorn decanate of the Taurus. Right. And it's linking immediately to Saturn, obviously, the another planet, mm -hmm. which is involved at the fourth initiation and it's in the first decanate of Scorpio, which leads us back to that Mercury. So we have a relationship established between these two planets, which are involved at the fourth initiation. And if you are estimating that he could have taken that fourth initiation, I was just wondering if you, uh, if you uh, found some hitting important transits to these two planets. I did with every initiation in the, cri in the criteria. I've just got the book open now, the fourth initiation, question mark, um, and the progressions and transits for that time. Um, one of the main ones was, uh, just a second. It was actually in 1925 when there was a whole bunch of stuff going on with the Theosophical Society and Annie Besant and Led Beter and all the rest all claimed that they took the fourth initiation and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot of glamour going around at the time, but um, some of those people were close to that, that level too. Um, Add something. Yeah, I'll just finish off what okay. I was going to say. Okay. Um, and so Christian Moody was caught up in a, in, in, with a whole bunch of stuff. 1925 is also a time that I associate with the hierarchy moving up from their ashrams from the mental plane to the buddhic plane because that was the installation of the Mahachalan, uh, at least I think so, in that year where the Mahachalan for the new root race, the sixth root race, was installed, so to speak. And Master R actually took over that, that particular role. Okay. Well, I see if he has taken that fourth initiation, we have a, a, another confirmation he might have he might have taken that fourth initiation because it's involving the ashram and the hierarchy. And the way I see it astrologically is that we have the axis of the midheaven, mm -hmm. the hierarchy, which is his dharma uh, for that life, and the IC, uh, which, is, uh, which is in the, in the Capricorn, um, that it's the ashram and hierarchy axis involved during uh, the process of that fourth initiation. Well, I'll, I'll read to you what, what I've, I've got here. Yeah. There's, 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 they're all there in place, so I'll, 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 um, I'll put you out of your misery. <laughs> 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 um, with the Mercury Saturn, anyway. Um, the first thing was it was the WESAC full moon. Okay, so it was, the full moon was exactly conduct Uranus at the time. So Uranus, of course, is an important factor because it's the ruler of his rising sign. Uh, are we in the same... Oh, you've, you've done the... That's going to be for WESEC 925. May the 8th, Michael. May the 8th. 
May, May 8, 1925. Thanks. Um, so just let me go through a, a couple of these things in the last few minutes we've got. Um, look at the prog actually, the progressive mid heaven is a bit further down. It doesn't matter. Um, I have 26 degrees to the progressive mid heaven, so I'm not sure what date you've got there. It doesn't matter. Um, one of the significant things is the progressive mid heaven, his Dharma, conjunct his moon, the past, I think that's important. Um, he had uh, Uranus was exactly conjunct the full moon. Uh, oh, full moon was conjunct Uranus, I should say. Saturn was up there. He'd just gone through his Saturn return. Um, he had progressed Jupiter, the sole ruler of the of the rising sign, was conjunct Mars. It's very significant. It's almost to the minute. He's ju progressed Jupiter and Mars there. Um, transiting Neptune square the sun, that's very significant, and also opposite the rising sign. One of the things I meant to mention before to follow on from what Nicholas said, the moon is the hierarchical ruler of Aquarius and it veils Neptune in some cases. Um, and of course Neptune is another name for the Christ in the West. So, and of course his brief was to be a mouthpiece for the Christ in that lifetime. So I, th I think Neptune square the sun was most significant. It's about it's very close. He would have been going through that transit probably for a year. Um, I'm not sure what phase of, of that year that it was there, but it's quite close. Neptune square the sun. Um, transiting Uranus was square the moon. So transiting Uranus is round here. 24, 22, fairly closely squaring the moon. Um, and we're getting to Saturn and Mercury. Um, transiting Mars and solar arc Mercury were conjunct Venus through there. Um, progressed Mercury was conjunct Mars there. And transiting Saturn was square solar arc Mars. So this solar arc Mars here, transiting Saturn exactly squaring Mars. Mars, uh, I, I didn't mention it before, um, but Mercury and Saturn are the two major planets that, that have a lot to do with the fourth initiation. Uh, Mercury, of course, rules the fourth ray um, and the fourth plane and so forth, so it has an association through that and, and represents the intuitive consciousness at, at its higher expression. And progressed Venus, Solar arc, Jupiter here were square to Saturn. So Saturn was active by transit and natally. And this is what I found with most initiations. I have a kind of full explanation of it here. I'm just sort of touching on a few things there. So um, I think you know, most, most criteria were, were um, sufficiently, in my mind, in place for that to be a, a um, to qualify him for the fourth degree, as, as it were. Another uh, important point needed for an initiation like this is uh, the involvement of uh, an eclipse, which carries, uh, should we say, the first aspect into the form aspect. Um, and in this case, there was an eclipse on February 9, mm -hmm. taking place on the axis of uh, 1939. Leo Aquarius, which oh, is okay. his ho horizon, mm. squaring his Sun-Earth axis yes. and his Uranus as well. So, so that eclipse hit his major points and thus mm. the first aspect and the third aspect were united as I see. Oh, most definitely. I think eclipses six months, three months, nine months before an event are incredibly powerful and particularly when you have a planet or progression transiting over that eclipse which activates it and Neptune in this case was strongly activating it as the perhaps failed hierarchical ruler of Aquarius so uh, he reached in a sense maybe he was slated to take the fourth in that life um, he certainly reached a very high stage of, of unfoldment and, uh, and took the renunciation initiation no um, I 
did a bit of research on the time though. What time does it say? Can't, can't read it from here. Um, Seven twenty seven twenty five, isn't it? Um, no. Twelve twenty five AM. Okay. I well, it's a little bit later. A few minutes later. Maybe. maybe another degree. Would be even more perfect. Thinking about the uh, yeah. progressed mid heaven, for example, with respect to moon Well, I actually had twenty six degrees in my book there. So I'm not sure why that one's come to twenty four. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and it was it's like right on the moon. It just passed over the moon. Yeah. Well, that's that should be right. Um, okay. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.